Hello, I'm Adrienne Fu Berman. In this session, I'm going to talk to you about how pharmaceutical industry promotion affects prescribing. Here are our course faculty. My conflict of interest disclosure is that I'm a paid expert witness in litigation regarding pharmaceutical marketing practices. Here are the conflict of interest disclosures for all the faculty for this module. The course objectives are listed here, and I'll just give you a moment to look at them. So marketing tactics include many things, and the ones that we're going to be covering today are detailing or drug rep visits, prescription tracking, drug samples, medical science liaisons and key opinion leaders, data tracking software and apps, and also meetings and events. So we're going to start with drug reps. So drug reps have your number. They know when they come into your office, what you prescribe, and also they have information on who influences you and who you influence. There are many reasons that prescribers give for seeing reps, including drug reps give me information on new drugs or reps provide samples. They bring lunch for the office and some reps are my friends. Here's why these reasons are problematic. Do reps really keep you informed on new drugs? Well, new drugs, first of all, aren't always the best drugs. And secondly, about three quarters of new drugs aren't new drugs at all. They're just tweaked versions of old drugs. Maybe a new dose, maybe a new formulation, maybe a combination product, or possibly a minor molecular change on a previous drug. The most aggressively promoted drugs are actually the, the least innovative. So, and you can imagine that a drug that's really great doesn't need to be promoted. It's really the more mediocre drugs that need to have the most promotion. And drug reps don't have objective information about drugs, especially about harms. Certainly everyone likes to have lunch catered, and, uh, but there's reasons that, that reps bring lunch to the office. It's a way to get what they call gatekeepers, um, the medical assistants and receptionists to uh, let the rep in to see the uh, physician. And it's a way of buying some time with the physician as well. Lunch is incredibly effective, says one former drug rep. We got the numbers of what the physicians were prescribing. If I brought in lunch one week, I could see the following week if that lunch had an impact. And we probably don't need studies to tell us this, but there have been psychology studies that show that people are more open to ideas when they're eating. And, um, and free food always increases attendance. It's been shown that free food increases attendance at grand rounds, for example. Food, of course, is a kind of gift. And meals and gifts are an important um, part of what drug reps provide. These are some quotes from former drug reps. Shahara Mahari is currently a physician in New York. And he says that during training, he was told, the physician is eating with a friend. You are eating with a client. Michael Aldani, a former drug rep who's now an anthropologist, says the essence of pharmaceutical gifting are bribes that aren't considered bribes. Every culture has a rule of reciprocation. If someone gives you something, you're supposed to give something back. The way that physicians return the meals and gifts that drug reps provide is through the prescriptions that they write. And studies have shown that even if you dislike someone who gives you a gift or provides a meal, you still feel a subconscious obligation to them. Even small favors or small gifts that were uninvited still provoke a sense of indebtedness. So when you get address labels in the mail from a charity, you're more likely to give money to that charity. If a, uh, if a server provides a mint on the, on the check, you're more likely to give a bigger tip. So even small, tiny gifts still have a, uh, an effect in terms of triggering the sense of that one must reciprocate. Some clinicians consider the reps their friends, but they're not your friends. Drug reps are trained to psychologically manipulate you. They are trained to assess what your personality is. They take personality tests themselves too, so that they can learn how their personality interacts with particular personalities of clinicians that they're seeing. They're trained to look around a room and see, are there pictures of children on a clinician's desk? Is there a guitar in the corner? What are interests that they can ask um, a clinician about? 
And um, sometimes they, they, they might know that a, a physician particularly likes excellent restaurants or they particularly like looking at scientific studies, whatever it is, that rep will provide it. And they have an effect. So uh, um, as I said, even a, a minute of interaction with a drug rep will affect what a clinician um, prescribes. The more a clinician sees drug reps, the more prescriptions are written. And even though physicians think that they can somehow separate um, the good information that a rep is providing from bad information, it's been shown that they actually cannot separate correct from incorrect information. And that uh, when physicians see reps, their beliefs about specific drugs correlate more with promotional materials than they do with scientific evidence. Certainly being a drug rep is a, a decent living. <laughs> the median base salary for drug reps in 2020 was over $100,000 and the median total salary was over $170,000. So that includes bonuses which are given based on um, the sales of drugs in the reps region. Specialty reps cost even more and companies may spend more than $300,000 a year on a specialty rep, including um, expenses, salary, bonuses, and training. Drug reps don't target everyone. Pharma doesn't target everyone for promotion. The physicians and clinicians who are targeted are the ones who are affecting market share. So if you're a clinician who writes mainly for generic drugs, you're not going to get a lot of visits from drug reps. It's the ones who are moving uh, market share for branded drugs that get the most visits. On the other hand, Specialists um, will be visited by drug reps because even if they don't write a lot of prescriptions, they control a lot of prescriptions. When a cardiologist writes a prescription for an antihypertensive, the primary care doc is very likely to continue that prescription. So specialists control a lot of prescriptions. People who influence physicians also are targeted. So people who are teachers, people who are uh, members of formulary committees, really anyone who controls market share is going to be targeted. Sometimes that includes payers. Sometimes it even includes patients. So uh, when a drug rep comes into the office, they have a lot of information about the physician. There are companies that specialize in gathering information about clinicians. So here's a company that says, we know everything about physicians except their tea times. They have information on what um, insurance the physician takes, what, what their hospital affiliations are, what the names of their um, assistants are, and all kinds of information. How much a company spends on physicians in order to generate one prescription is also tracked. So this company is pointing out that there's different amounts of money that are being spent per each physician in order to generate one prescription. And the company might want to rethink its strategy for Dr. Williams as it's spending twice as much money per prescription as they are for other physicians. So how, how do they know exactly how much they're costing in terms of promotion for each prescription? It's prescription tracking, or also called data mining. And there are companies, um, IQVIA is a large company, and there's other health information organizations that buy prescription information from pharmacies. Most pharmacies in the U.S. will sell this information to these companies, and then they package that information for pharmaceutical companies. And um, usually the physician's only identified by license number or another identifier on the prescriptions, but that information is decoded by uh, information that's bought from the American Medical Association. The AMA keeps track of every physician in the United States, whether or not you're a, a member, and the information linking your name to your license numbers and other identification numbers is sold by the AMA through its master file um, data. Patient records are sold to industry as well. Most insurance companies will, um, will sell patient records to industry, and that is HIPAA compliant as long as it's de-identified information. So these pharma vendors know they can have um, very detailed information on patients, what their conditions are, when the last time they were in a hospital, when the last time they saw a physician was, what medications they're on, as long as that data is de-identified, it doesn't have the patient's name on it, it is HIPAA compliant. That, the information from patient records is put together with prescribing data in order to create very finely granular information on physicians. So when a drug rep comes into the office, that drug rep knows exactly what antihypertensive you prefer in your patients over 70, 
or what hyperlipidemia agent you prefer in diabetics, for example. A key part of what drug reps provide as a serv and what's considered a service is drug samples. And a lot of physicians tell us, I only see reps for the samples. We might notice that the rep is only dropping off a week or two of samples. They're not dropping off a year's worth. And that's so that they can have a few words with you while they're dropping off those drug samples. Physicians and other prescribers believe that samples are helpful to patients um, and that they're, they're good for patients who um, are low income or uninsured. But in fact, studies show that low income and uninsured patients are actually less likely to get samples than middle class and upper class patients. Samples are probably the most effective, or they're one of the most effective marketing strategies that pharmaceutical companies have. The real purpose of samples is to get in the door, to gain access to prescribers, and to habituate prescribers into writing for particular targeted drugs. No one gives a patient a sample for one medication and then writes a prescription for another medication. That would be strange. So it, it's giving the prescriber practice in writing particular prescriptions. You might notice also that samples are always for newer, expensive drugs that are used chronically. They're never for a drug that's only going to be used for three days. Doctors and patients uh, like samples, it seems like a little gift. And of course, many samples go home with physicians and their staffs. But they compromise good patient care. It's been shown that when there's a sample closet available, physicians and residents will choose a second line treatment, even when they're aware of current prescribing guidelines, even when they're asked what a first line treatment is, and they know if a second line treatment is available in the sample closet, that's what they're sending the patient home with. Here's what industry says about samples. You keep sampling until a point of saturation where additional samples are not going to make a physician write any more prescriptions. And sampling is the best way for pharmaceutical companies to gain access to a physician and persuade the physician to prescribe their, their product. If you don't believe me, just give away all your samples as full courses of therapy and watch your sample supply dry up. The rep will probably say something like, they're having a manufacturing problem and that's why you can't get any more samples. But oddly, that manufacturing problem isn't affecting the availability of the drug in the drugstore. Industry calls docs who don't see drug reps no see docs. And in, in 2019, about 40% of primary care physicians didn't have any interactions with drug reps. We really hope that to increase that percentage to 100%. Even if you never see drug reps, pharmaceutical companies may send other representatives to your office, particularly medical science liaisons or MSLs. MSLs come with some other names as well. Sometimes they're called a scientific affairs liaison, a scientific affairs manager or regional medical associate. And these are employees of a pharmaceutical company who have an advanced degree, usually a PharmD, sometimes another advanced degree. And the restrictions that apply to sales reps don't apply to MSLs. Companies say that MSLs will provide scientific information to physicians that if perhaps a medication is left out overnight um, that should normally be refrigerated, is that medication still good? That's, that's the information that they say that their medical affairs offices provide. But in fact, MSLs serve a secret marketing uh, function. Their job is to foster relationships with physicians, um, to invite them to for speaking opportunities or for research opportunities. Um, and, what, and physicians are very likely to spend a lot longer time with an MSL because they consider them to be scientists from the company. So while they might only spend less than a minute with a drug rep, they might spend half an hour, an hour with an MSL. And the, uh, while uh, it's against the law for a drug rep to push an off-label use of a drug, it's not against the law for an MSL to talk about off-label uses or talk about drugs in the pipeline. So MSLs are really industry's way of getting around laws regulating drug reps. Let's say you don't see drug reps and you refuse to see MSLs as well. You probably still go to medical meetings. And you might notice that while you're at that conference, you're getting ads for specific products on your phone or tablet. That's not a coincidence. Your personal data is being tracked. Geofencing is when is the creation of a virtual perimeter um, around a geographic area. 
Using information from apps with location services, pharmaceutical companies can target advertising to anyone within a specific perimeter, for example, a medical center or a conference center or a hotel where a meeting is being held. There is a, um, a, a more detailed version of this called geotargeting. And with geotargeting, NPI numbers um, or other identifiers are used to target ads only to physicians in a particular specialty or physicians identified by another, um, another demographic or behavior or interest. Here is a, a company that specializes in real-time location um, targeting, and you can see that they can reach healthcare providers in hospitals, physician offices, medical conferences, treatment centers, as well as pharmacies and retail clinics. So some examples of geofencing and geotargeting. Um, for example, there was a team that was uh, marketing a meningitis B vaccine, and they, they created a geofence around an American Academy of Pediatrics annual meeting. So anybody who was within that perimeter was received um, targeted ads. And in an example of geotargeting, there was a six-month campaign that was actually aimed at physicians who don't see drug reps, at those no-see um, healthcare providers. They're identified by NPI number, and then they received ads while they were using mobile devices in specific predetermined point-of-care facilities. And the result of that campaign were that scripts for the targeted drug doubled while the campaign was running. Even if you stay home, your online footprint is followed. So pharma vendors track what websites you visit and what you're looking for, what you're searching for on those websites. That information is then packaged and sent to pharmaceutical companies. Hippocrates is a very popular app and Hippocrates and other apps track who's looking up what, what drug classes are you looking at, what specific drugs are you looking at. All of that information is taken and transmitted to pharma. And here is, uh, this is an ad from Hippocrates to Pharma. Let's smash your return on investment goals. This is a quote from a former Pfizer executive. The beauty of the work we do with Hippocrates is that we literally put ourselves in the palm of their hand. So meetings and events are uh, often sponsored by Pharma. And um, they, of course, they sponsor conferences, large conferences, and give money to professional societies. But they also will sponsor grand rounds, journal clubs, smaller meetings, and many continuing medical education events as well. Often these are funded by what are called unrestricted or unconditional grants. But those unconditional grants are only unconditional until you are saying things that don't agree with their marketing messages. Um, often for grand rounds, for example, or journal clubs, a company um, will agree to fund lunch for the residents and medical students and attendings, um, say, for a year, and you can invite whatever speakers you want. And they might not even say anything for the first year, but the second year, they'll probably give you a list of suggested speakers. And you're not going to feel compromised inviting any of those speakers. They'll be well-known people. You'll have seen them at national medical meetings. You might have read articles by them. It doesn't feel like a compromise to invite them. But those speakers will be carrying marketing messages for specific therapies. Let's say you refuse to invite any of the recommended speakers to your series. Funding for that series will dry up the next year. And you'll just be told that, oh, there's budgetary constraints. Most of the continuing medical education that physicians participate in, and also nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and pharmacists, are funded by industry. And most physicians and other healthcare providers are not able to detect commercial bias in CME. It's very difficult to detect. Industry-sponsored continuing medical education and other meetings and events often use key opinion leaders called KOLs by industry. Industry actually spends about a quarter of its marketing budget on KOLs, um, and there are pharma vendors that actually specialize in identifying up-and-coming faculty members, for example, or other people who are getting published or getting known in a particular area to be groomed by industry um, and flown around to speak at various conferences and perhaps have assistance with writing articles. Opinion leaders are actually identified at every level. Even in a rural area, the doc that everyone turns to in that area will be identified as a local opinion leader. A regional opinion leader might be somebody who's known in a tri-state area. But the KOLs are generally nationally known opinion leaders who are usually at academic institutions. 
and are seen as particularly effective in affecting the opinions of their peers. KOLs are very important for pre-launch marketing before drugs on the market, for increasing the awareness of what industry calls disease states, for expanding diagnostic categories. So you may have noticed that the level at which we diagnose diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, or high blood pressure have changed over time. The numbers have gotten lower. And part of that is due to key opinion leaders who are on um, expert um, committees that establish these guidelines. Key opinion leaders are used in a lot of different environments. They may promote unproven uses of drugs. Um, they may be used to mitigate perceptions about adverse effects, and they're used to battle competing therapies. The job of the KOL is never to sell a drug. The job of the KOL is to sell diseases. And the, the, the physician speaker um, himself or herself may not even know what the marketing message is that they're conveying. KOLs often say that they don't change what they say just because they're paid by pharma. And that may very well be true. They're not, they're not necessarily saying what pharma tells them to say, but they are selected because what they're saying backs a marketing message that pharmaceutical company is particularly interested in. If a KOL starts saying something that does not back marketing goals, that KOL will be dropped. It's never their job to push the drug, it's their job to push the disease. And there's a strong correlation between increasing payments to key opinion leaders and increased prescriptions in that area. There's a new kind of opinion leader out called a digital opinion leader, or DOL, or a connected opinion leader, COL. These are often um, healthcare providers who aren't, aren't academic, but have a following on social media. So anybody who is influencing their peers will get the attention of pharma. But industry-funded CME will always contain marketing messages. It may promote an industry-friendly perspective. It helps with pre-launch promotion. Before a drug is approved, it will be talking about the disease. It promotes off-label uses, um, again, something that drug reps can't do. And it might exaggerate the benefits of specific targeted drugs while underplaying the risks. And it might be overplaying the risks of competing drugs or competing therapies while underplaying the benefits of those competitors. Industry-sponsored CME increases prescribing of specific drugs. Throughout many of the tactics that I've been um, telling you about today runs a thread of social psychology. How, how are they persuading us to use their drugs? How are they influencing us? And um, this goes back to Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays is the nephew of Sigmund Freud and is considered the father of public relations. And what Edward Bernays did was to do these great campaigns that increased the sales of products without fo focusing on the products themselves. So one of his more brilliant campaigns was the Torches of Freedom campaign. In the 1920s, women didn't smoke as much as men and um, tobacco companies saw that as an untapped market. So they hired Edward Bernays and Bernays had his secretary light up a cigarette in the middle of Fifth Avenue and announce that women were just as good as men and smoking proved it was so. So they linked smoking with feminism, and that really increased smoking rates among women. Another campaign that Edward Bernays was involved in was he was hired by a piano company, and he did an entire PR campaign um, that increased the sales of pianos without mentioning the word piano. And what he did was he sold people on the idea of a music room, that every well-appointed home should have a room that was devoted to the enjoyment and playing of music. Well, what would you put in a music room if you had a room that was just devoted to music? It was like it came to people as though it were their own idea <laughs> that what this music room needs is a piano. Very successful campaign. These PR techniques are also used to sell drugs. There are more than 10,000 drugs on the US market, but more than half of promotional expenditures are concentrated on the top 50 drugs. And those tend to be the drugs that physicians and other healthcare providers are most aware of. There are many older generic drugs that are just as good or better than the drugs that we um, know most about. Industry may establish or redefine new conditions, and many of the diseases that medical students are learning about today were actually created by pharmaceutical companies. Um, here is a partial list of conditions that were invented or redefined by industry, and uh, we have a lot of information about this on the Farmed Out website. 
In order to sell an invented or redefined disease, marketing messages often focus on how a particular condition or symptom is underdiagnosed. It's widespread. It affects quality of life. Um, it might also say that the current treatments for this symptom or condition are absent or they're inadequate or they're problematic. And that sets the stage for um, a, a therapy in a process that's called condition branding. So condition branding is when a particular therapy is linked with a particular disease state. This scary picture, I think, sort of sums up what industry wants from us. Um, they want to affect what we tell patients. They want to affect what we're telling patients about therapeutics and about conditions. And uh, while that might be very good for industry's bottom line, it's very bad for public health. There's no question that promotion influences prescribing. There have been many studies that have shown that promotion influences prescribing. And there are also, many of these studies have also shown that it's difficult to convince the physicians that promotion affects their own individual behavior. Um, I hope that this presentation has helped to convince you that you too are influenced by pharma promotion. There are things that you can do to prescribe without industry influence. Here are some things. Don't see drug reps or MSLs. Don't accept gifts or food from industry. Don't accept or give out samples. Don't go to industry-funded events. And don't give patients industry-funded material. Trust unbiased sources of information. Do your own research on therapeutics and create your own formulary with a focus on older classic drugs. Next, we're going to be hearing from several experts who are going to talk to us about successful strategies for avoiding industry influence and using unbiased information about drugs. We'll hear from Melissa Christopher, who's the National Director of Academic Detailing Services at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, Jerry Avorn, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Co-Director of the National Resource Center for Academic Detailing at Boston Medical Center, and Maisha Draves, who's the Medical Director for Pharmacy in Northern California for the Permanente Medical Group. Thank you for your interest in Kaiser Permanente's approach to pharmaceutical detailing as an integrated system. I'm Dr. Maisha Draves, a practicing physician in family medicine and the medical director of pharmacy in Northern California, Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente has an internal approach to academic detailing. Our evidence-based process is conducted by clinical pharmacist experts who through independent and thorough reviews determine the best evidence-based information. This is done in collaboration with physician specialists who are actively practicing in their field. At Kaiser Permanente, we then develop our own evidence-based materials and processes to educate physicians and other prescribers. We leverage our physician and pharmacy partnership. We have strong collaborative partnerships with physicians and pharmacists to support internal academic detailing. We identify thought leaders and experts to work together and create a circle of support. The engagement and participation allows us to co-design together from beginning to end and solidify our unified commitment and responsibility to evidence-based medicine. We also limit the influence of sales representatives. Kaiser Permanente discourages pharmaceutical representatives and other paid clinicians from entering our facilities. Any requested information provided is closely scrutinized to maintain our strict focus on evidence. Physicians are strongly discouraged from accepting free samples or gifts. We also have very strong conflict of interest policies for our pharmacists and physicians that engage in evidence-based reviews of medication and academic detailing. It's important that all materials, reviews, and recommendations are unbiased and evidence-based. Once our pharmacists and physician experts have reviewed the evidence and developed recommendations, documents and tools are developed for use in academic detailing and for use during clinical care. We have materials for physicians and other prescribers such as flyers, posters, FAQs, presentations, pocket guides, newsletters, and even utilization data. We also have materials for our patients such as letters, handouts, posters, and news articles. We've adapted our dissemination of academic detailing to match the new technology world around us and the advancement of telehealth. 
We continue to provide academic detailing to physicians and other prescribers in the traditional in-person venues, but we also now provide academic detailing through the virtual spaces, both audio and video. Our pharmacy and physician team of experts will meet with broad groups via chiefs groups of specific specialties at department meetings and with clinical pharmacists. We also continue to meet in group and one-on-one. -on -one. We also use lunch and learn sessions. Our evidence-based process is a virtuous cycle of continuous learning and refining. We review existing evidence, gather specialty input, and we continue to monitor additional clinical trials, real-world data on safety and efficacy, and we look at our own internal data. We revise our evidence-based materials and education as needed, based on new learnings and as the evidence evolves. As a result of our committed evidence-based process and commitment to the physician-pharmacy partnership that's conflict of interest fee, you can see our rates of adherence. We're successful with our formulary at 97.5%, generics at 99.77%, and our biosimilars at 88 to 98%. A great example of our successful evidence-based academic detailing process in Kaiser Permanente are our biosimilars. We have a commitment with our pharmacy physician partnership over the past six years to create endorsements that are evidence-based with key stakeholders, to develop and negotiate contracts that meet our needs, to vet our biosimilar process for formulary through our P&T committee, to utilize our education to communicate and provide information to all of our prescribers, Operationally, we can embed these materials in our electronic health record and at direct points of care. And we're able to implement inventory strategies. And finally, we're able to track utilization. We're also able to re-educate and provide academic detailing when needed and monitor for safety and efficacy. At Kaiser Permanente, we have the ability to move market share. This process allows us to deliver our promise and great care with over 90% of the given market share in the biosimilars over a very short period of time. Kaiser Permanente has 12.4 million members that represents about 4% of the covered lives in the United States. We take very seriously providing an evidence-based care model and our internal academic detailing supports this. Finally, in closing, some thoughts of what we need to continue our success in assessing a drug's value. On the clinical practice side, we feel that Kaiser Permanente success really is by maintaining our strong physician pharmacy partnership, promoting evidence-based medicine, and our physician resolve to avoid the pressures of experimenting in clinical practice. On the regulatory side and areas of improvement that would continue to make our job of assessing value easier would be tighter standards on expedited review pathways to ensure we have adequate evidence on the efficacy and the safety of a new drug coming to market without leaving clinicians and patients with more questions than answers. A judicious use of the real world evidence in the drug approval process, real world evidence that would complement but not replace the data from adequately designed clinical trials. An increased oversight over post-market studies, ensuring there are no delays and ensuring that it answers the unanswered questions so that we can continue to deliver high value, high efficacious and safety care to our patients. And finally, to deter abuse from the Orphan Drug Act. We value the great innovations, but we do wanna make sure that they are efficacious and safe when they come to market. With these changes and our clinical approach, we feel these are successful principles to create a fair and balanced method toward determining value. 
Thank you for letting us share our story at Kaiser Permanente on internal academic detailing. Hello, I'm Jerry Avorn, and I'm going to be talking with you briefly today about academic detailing, what it is, where it came from, and how it can be used. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the founder of its uh, division of pharmacoepidemiology, which we affectionately call DOPE, as well as an academic detailing nonprofit uh, known as Alosa Health. And we'll be talking a little bit more about those in the next few minutes. I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, Alosa is not for profit, and I don't get paid for any of my academic detailing work. Uh, none of us in my division accept any funding as consultants uh, from any drug companies. And most of the funding in my division comes from the federal government. And of course, everybody at Alosa is uh, free of any drug company consultancies. So I years ago realized that uh, a key aspect of improving prescribing is realizing that scientific knowledge does not disseminate itself. That those of us who work in medical schools often have a very good grasp of the evidence, but we're often very lousy communicators. Uh, drug companies, on the other hand, are great communicators, and they really know how to push their message out, as you've been hearing in other parts of this course. But of course, they only do it in order to sell more product. And so back in the late 70s and early 80s, I began to wonder whether it might be possible to take that very effective kind of educational outreach that the companies do, but put it in service not of just pushing product, but of uh, essentially marketing the very best evidence. Hence, academic detailing. It was like detailing the drug company's sales efforts, but it came from an academic base and was designed to just improve medication use rather than sell product. So here's how it works. We review and synthesize the literature on a given clinical topic, whether it's diabetes or Alzheimer's disease or pain management. We then produce a short action-oriented brochure, which internally we call the unadvertisement, uh, as well as a thick backup document with loads of references that summarize the literature on which it's based, as well as materials for patients, because after all, you need to get the patient on your side to improve uh, the medication use that they are being asked to take. We then train pharmacists and uh, nurses and occasionally a, an MD to uh, understand both the clinical issues that they're going to be teaching about, but also essentially how to be a salesperson, how to do adult learning, how to take somebody from point A to point B in a way that is responsive to their educational needs. And then after that, we send them out into the field and they meet one-on-one -on -one with doctors in their offices, much as the sales reps or detailers of the drug industry do. The goal is simply to close the gap between the very best available evidence and actual prescribing practice so that each prescription uh, that a patient gets is only based on the most current, accurate, and important and impartial evidence about what works, what doesn't, and what's cost-effective. It's grown a lot since those early days in the 1980s. There have been over 100 randomized controlled trials demonstrating that academic detailing works, and a number of integrated delivery systems and other settings have adopted it. You'll be hearing from Melissa Christopher about the excellent and large VA academic detailing service that she founded. The Kaiser Health Organization also has its own uh, academic detailing program, which is very impressive. And as we move toward or try to move toward accountable care organizations, one hopes that this will be an important tool for them to do quality control and outcome management, as well as maintaining uh, cost uh, effectiveness uh, for the medications that are being used. Alosa, as I said, is named um, after the genus of fish that swim upstream, like herrings and shads, because that's what we felt that we are doing. It's based here in Boston, and it's not for profit. Uh, our initial funding came from the State Department of Aging in Pennsylvania. We've now broadened that out to have uh, support from other departments of health uh, for a variety of clinical topics. And our work on uh, trying to get doctors to use less opioids has been supported from a number of sources, including the CDC and the Aetna Health Insurance Company. There are also very large uh, programs in Canada and in Australia as well. Here's an example of some of the materials we've created over the years. Uh, the front of it looks like a drug ad, um, but the back of it has got text that is evidence-based and often encourages doctors to not overuse drugs. 
This is a program we did to get uh, physicians not to prescribe sedating medications for sleep when it's not appropriate. This is kind of an ad for side effects in which we talk about if you're going to give uh, sedating meds to the elderly, you need to take in, take into account the fact that they're going to cause some very important side effects that you may want to avoid. Uh, this is another piece that we did on antipsychotics, and this is one of our pieces on trying to not overuse opioids or use them at all in managing pain. Uh, Adelosa, we've developed a number of modules, and they uh, when they are current, are up on our uh, website for anyone to use in a non-commercial way that will benefit patients. And you can see some of the topics listed here from diabetes to atrial fibrillation, heart failure, osteoporosis, and so forth. When they get a little old, we take them down and redo them. And that's why we only keep the current ones up on the website. But you're welcome to take a look at it. And um, to the extent that you want to use it in any non-commercial way, that's fine with us. Here are some additional resources that you might find helpful about academic detailing and research related to it. Uh, our division at Harvard and the Brigham and Women's Hospital, DOPE, has its website at drugepi.org, and its subunits, uh, the most relevant here being Portal, run by uh, my colleague Aaron Kesselheim, is at portalresearch.org. Uh, more information about academic detailing can be found uh, at alosahealth.org. And the National Resource Center on um, Academic Detailing, which Mike Fisher and I founded years ago and is funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, has a number of useful materials on it that will be of interest to anyone trying to start or, or improve an academic detailing program. And finally, I wrote this book called Powerful Medicines that uh, is still available on Amazon years later that uh, talks about these issues in greater detail. I thank you for your attention, and I hope this has been useful for you in learning a little bit about academic detailing to undo some of the excesses of promotion from the pharmaceutical industry. Goodbye. My name is Dr. Melissa Christopher, and I'm the National Director of Academic Detailing Services for the Department of Veteran Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you today some of the work the Veteran Health Administration has created to help clinicians deliver the very best quality of care guided by the evidence. We have many free resources that health professionals, healthcare professionals can use to as alternatives to information provided by pharmaceutical industry. I will review five publicly available sites that include resources for healthcare professionals and patients to support decision-making in evidence-based care. There is an overwhelming amount of information out there and getting the evidence into action is critical for every healthcare professional's practice. In VHA, we are fortunate to have resources available for our clinical staff. In 2010, the Institute of Medicine identified VA and the Department of Defense as leaders in clinical practice guideline development. These guidelines are synthesized with the available literature and are used to help guide clinicians on, their, on where their evidence supports treatment decisions. Guidelines facilitate learning and can help accountability with and help clinicians contextualize the rising rate of new information coming from clinicians' inboxes every day. Guidelines on the VA and Department of Defense sites are endorsed by the VA DOD Evidence-Based Practice Workgroup and a service that is really supports the care for patients under the care of the DOD and the VA. This includes active duty servicemen and women, their families, as well as our veterans following their separation of service. Here you can see newly approved guidelines over an array of chronic disease management topics, as well as other conditions like pregnancy that require specific recommendations for management. The other resources I'd like to highlight are from our VHA train site, which offers free continuing medical education for everyone as well as education required by our Mission Act for community providers who treat veterans with prescribing opioids. These sites are regularly updated with new resources, and you can subscribe to be notified 
when new topics and CME modules are added. The third site I want to review is our VA Community of Care resources. In 2018, the Mission Act gave veterans benefits that could provide access to community care, including emergency and urgent care services. This has led to VA investing in high quality care delivery no matter where the veteran was receiving it. Resources on the Community of Care site include additional training and tools that can support the community provider in delivering care to our veterans. The fourth site that I would like to review is the VHA Pharmacy Benefits Management Service public website. This has a lot of information for specifically for medications. VHA conducts comprehensive reviews of all medications used to care for our population and to help clinicians with clinical decision making. You'll find our formulary tool, which includes medication criteria for use recommendations. Additionally, you'll see that we have the academic detailing services, discussion guides, and quick reference guides on national topics. These topics help to close the gap on care and improve care delivery for our veterans. You will see both patients and provider resources to help with overdose prevention, treatment of substance use disorders, and other conditions. These educational tools really provide a menu of care options to help patients and providers make decisions together. Academic detailing is a service that we deliver in VA, and this is really for in-person educational outreach sessions that are provided by pharmacists skilled in influencing practice change. It, this is foundational services, and it's really based on developing trust with our providers and their healthcare teams to help overcome barriers and implement evidence-based practice recommendations. VHA has developed many educational resources to work on these difficult topics with our providers. Some of these topics, such as opioid use disorder, insomnia, high-risk concerns with benzodiazepines and post-traumatic stress disorder, overdose prevention, and even targeting specific practice areas like the emergency department. Only 9.3 million of our veterans are getting care with VA facilities and our outpatient locations, leaving over 11 million veterans receiving care in our community. That's why VA has a vested interest in increasing access to the quality of educational resources to the community providers, including accessing the academic detailing resources that we have available. We have important information bulletins from our VA MedSafe to raise awareness to clinicians on safety issues regarding medication. VA MedSafe evaluates and monitors adverse events and safety signals, and we share this information with the prescribers so they can address treatment concerns. Another resource I want to make you aware of is our Veterans Health Library. It has written, video, and mobile application resources to support patients in their whole health journey. We want to empower patients with information for shared decision making and help support them in self-management of their health conditions. In this time of information overload, it is important to be able to find reliable resources that allow clinicians to navigate their options and to know how the evidence should be really guide decisions for optimal health. I hope some of our resources will benefit your practice. Thank you so much for attending the CME activity. There are more resources that are available on the Farmed Out website, including fact sheets and information summaries on a variety of pharmaceutical marketing techniques. So please come visit us.